What do you know about it, Chigelski? What do any of us know about anything? Hi everyone, Jim Jag here. Thank you for stopping by and checking out the channel. Now in the previous episode, we talked about how the 6502 in my retro computer sends data to the Raspberry Pi Pico. But in this episode, we'll talk about what happens to that data once the Raspberry Pi Pico gets it. For example, outputting the character, creating graphics, creating and moving sprites, and other operations that the VGA subsystem performs on the retro computer itself. As a reminder, you can see a demonstration of some of the basic capabilities of the Pi Pico chip, including graphics primitives, circles, lines, boxes, things of that nature, as well as hardware and software scrolling, the 16 colors available on the VGA subsystem, as well as three additional fonts to the main system console font. All these fonts are code page 437 compatible, which means that they include the basic uh, graphics uh, uh, icons for the higher valued numbers. The first function of the VGA subsystem on the Pi Pico console chip is to actually generate the VGA signals that are required for a 640 by 480 at 60 hertz monitor. Here we see the timing for the industry standard 640 by 480 resolution. And recall that these were all based on the old CRT model, which actually had an electron tube scanning back and forth across a phosphor screen. So that's the reason why some of these timings exist. In addition to the main pixel frequency of 25 megahertz, well, a smidge of more than 25 megahertz, we also have some horizontal and vertical sync frames that we need to worry about. And this is the period of time it takes for the electron beam to scan from left to right, as well as to go back up to the top upper left of the screen. My implementation of the VGA subsystem and the software on the Raspberry Pi Pico is heavily based on the VGA driver code and project created by Hunter Adams. There is a link to this page and to the work in the description. The way we generate these sync signals is by leveraging the PIO capability of the Raspberry Pi Pico. Basically, the idea is since we know the clock frequency of the Raspberry Pi Pico, and therefore we know how long it takes for a specific PIO opcode to run, we can basically just count the number of clocks while we're in a specific phase of the horizontal or vertical sync, and then generate the required on or off pulse signals on the pins between the VGA connector and the Raspberry Pi Pico. And that is basically what we're doing in these two PIO programs. First, looking at the horizontal sync generator PIO program, you can see that we break down the actual clock frequencies or the number of clocks for the Raspberry Pi Pico that we are in the various phases for the horizontal sync. 16 clock cycles were in the front porch, 96 clock cycles were doing the sync pulse, the back porch is 48 clock cycles, which when you combine them all, we're going to be active for 640 clocks. So the PIO program is quite easy. It's simply making sure that the pins are high or low for those correct number of clock signals by knowing that, for example, setting the pin to zero takes one clock cycle, and then we're also delaying for another 31, which means that 
This sets the pulse low for 32 clock signals. We're doing it again, which brings us up to 64. And then we're doing it once more, which brings us up to 96. At that point, we're at the back porch phase. So we set the pin high for the correct number of signals. And then we send an IRQ or an interrupt signal to signify to the other PIO programs that we are at the end of line, that basically the horizontal sync is complete. The function is very similar for the vertical sync. We see that we're in the front porch mode for 10 lines, the sync pulse for two lines, the back porch for 33 lines, and we are active for 480 lines. And since we know when a line ends, because the horizontal sync generator PIO program generates that interrupt for us, we can very easily keep track of the state machine for the vertical sync generation. And that is what this PIO program does itself. It waits until the horizontal sync is high, which means we've reached the end of the line, and then we signal that we're in active mode, in which case we now either pull the pin high or low, depending on where we are in the vertical sync frequency. The final PIO program for the VGA signaling is the one that actually pushes the data on the pins that connect to the R, G, and B pins of the VGA connector. Now this runs somewhat independently of the horizontal and vertical sync, although it is aware of those. But its function is to simply take the information that's in the video RAM of the Raspberry Pi Pico and to present it on the pins that are connected to the VGA input. So we've touched on the electrical aspects of the console chip and how it creates both the sync signals as well as the data signal to the VGA monitor. But we really haven't talked about how the graphics data is actually laid out and generated. There are two main methods of doing this. The first is the scan line, or otherwise known as chasing the beam method. And this uses the idea that let's create and populate an entire scan line worth of data and display that. And then while that data is being displayed, we can create the next scan line of data. Now this requires some exacting timing because you only have the length of time it takes to display a line to actually create the next line. However, the benefit of that is that you really don't need a large amount of memory to incorporate the graphics that you're using. This means that you're able to use much higher resolutions and a much deeper color depth than you would otherwise. The alternate method is what's known as the bitmap method, where every pixel on the screen is represented by a bit or a byte or even a word of data in memory. The advantage of this is that it's very easy to lay out the data in a way which makes sense to the programmer but it does require a huge amount of RAM available, especially for those displays with higher resolution or higher color depths. We're using the latter method, and to save space and to optimize the use of RAM, we use two pixels per byte. This means each pixel can be represented by four bits of data. Since we're using the bitmap mode, the first thing we need to do is to set aside memory space to hold the video and graphics data. To determine the size of the array needed, we multiply the screen width times the screen height and divide that by two. 
and then create a character array of that size. Recall that a character is one byte or eight bits, and so that works out quite nicely. We then create an address pointer to point to the very first element of the array. Now to figure out how to address each individual pixel, let's look at the function which draws an individual pixel. This is the function here that does that. As you can see, the first thing we do is figure out if the color of the pixel we're about to draw is in our internal format or in the standard RGB332 format. And if it is, we convert it to ours. If the resulting color corresponds to the transparent color, then we return because there's nothing to actually draw. We also do some range checks to make sure that we're not trying to draw a pixel outside of the screen resolution. And again, if it is outside of those limits, we return. We finally get to the meat of the function where we determine the actual offset into that character array that corresponds to the actual pixel that we want to draw. The address for the offset is the Y coordinate times the screen width plus the X coordinate. Now, because we store one pixel in the upper four bits and another pixel in the bottom four bits of that byte, we need to figure which of those four bits we're going to be manipulating. To do that, we look at the offset of the pixel, and if it's odd, for example, its address is 1, then we know that we need to manipulate the upper four bits of that byte. If it was even, for example, address zero, then it's the lower four bits. Now that may seem opposite. The normal expectation would be that as you have the bytes arrayed in memory, the upper four bits would correspond to address zero. The lower four bits would correspond to address one. In the next byte, the upper four bits would be address two, and address three would be the lower four bits of that byte. But due to the layout of the RP2040 byte structure, it's opposite from that. So for each pixel at an odd address, we mask out the upper four bits, and then set those upper four bits to the actual color code that were passed. For pixels at an even address, we mask the bottom four bits and then set the color of those four bits to the color that we were passed. So that's how you draw a pixel into the graphics memory, but how does that data end up on the VGA monitor itself? And to do that, we take advantage of the DMA capability of the Raspberry Pi Pico. So let's recall that the DMA capability of the RP2040, which is the core chip of the Pi Pico, runs independent of the CPU. And so it is an ideal, fast, and efficient way of copying data. We use this DMA capability to copy the data in the graphics memory array to the PIO program responsible for writing that data to the VGA subsystem. First, let's actually look at the DMA setup. The very first thing we do is create two DMA channels for this integration between the DMA subsystem and the PIO program. We then create the DMA transfer that basically sends all the data from the VGA data array to that PIO program. And once that's done, it gets reset. So we have this continual loop of transferring all the data from that VGA data array 
to the PIO subsystem that's responsible for writing it to the VGA subsystem. Looking at that PIO program, you can see that what it does is that it pulls that data from the DMA subsystem and pushes them out to the pins. It then loops back for each element of that array. Basically, for every pixel and every byte that corresponds to two pixels, this PIO program pulls in the byte that's being sent to it from the DMA subsystem and then pushes those out to the VGA system. As with the DMA subsystem, this happens continuously without any interaction with the CPU at all. Now the functions that create the basic graphic primitives, uh, lines, shapes, things of that nature, use this pixel by pixel technique, meaning that they basically figure out which pixels need to be drawn and draw each individual pixel. As you can imagine, this is not the most efficient way of doing it. But as we saw on the demo, performance is actually quite good. Even the function that draws a text character on the screen does so pixel by pixel. It does so by looking at the bitmap of the text character and depending on whether a bit needs to be enabled or disabled, draws each individual pixel. By comparison, when we need to fill the screen with a new color, we don't handle it pixel by pixel, but instead write the data all in one go. Here we see that we use a memset function to set the entire array to a specific color. As another example of how to quickly and more efficiently update and modify the graphics data, we're looking at two functions that actually implement the scrolling capability. In this particular case, we basically just move a huge chunk of data from one location to another, and then in the area corresponding to the bottom part of the screen, set that to whatever the background color is. We can either do this very, very quickly via a jump scroll, or in the case where we want to do it a bit more smoothly, we can actually take our time and do it scan line by scan line. Because sprites and tiles correspond to very large images and therefore large chunks and areas of memory, we need to handle this as efficiently and as effectively as possible. So with these, again, instead of going pixel by pixel, we try to operate on large areas of consecutive memory from either single bytes all the way up to six bytes at a time. By increasing that, we get much better performance. The actual mechanism used to draw the tiles and sprites, to move the sprites, as well as mask out the background for transparency, is the topic for our next video. Hope to see you then.